If there's one thing that Epcot is undoubtedly known for more than any of the other Disney World parks, it's gotta be the food. Considering the fact that all its different culinary options were once considered some of the main attractions over in World Showcase, you better believe they take their food pretty seriously. And it definitely shows, as Epcot to this day still owes some of the best in-park restaurants you can find on property. But not every restaurant can be phenomenal, and it wouldn't be Epcot without at least a couple of weird things to eat. Which reminds me, Hello everyone, and welcome back to Keep Epcot Weird, a video series focusing on the stranger and the more obscure aspects of Epcot. And this video is of course all about the park's restaurants and food. Everything from its old eateries that you never knew about, to the strange food offerings, and even a couple of food-based attractions. Um, but not, not those types of food-based attractions. We've already been there, and I don't want to go back. Um, so anyways, to start us off with something small for this episode, a uh, little appetizer if you will, I want to start up at the front of the park, with a couple of the lesser-known restaurants in the old Communicore buildings. The first of which is over in Communicore East, with the Stargate Restaurant. Even considered obscure back when it was still operating, the Stargate basically functioned as Future World's one-stop shop, for people without too adventurous of a palate offering all your usual suspects when it comes to Disney quick service foods. You know, pizzas, hamburgers, salads, really nothing too special. But it was noteworthy for eventually turning into the Electric Umbrella in 1994, as part of the larger transformation of the original Communicore into the updated Innoventions. Partially to match the surrounding attraction's new theming, the old space saw a major redesign done by Imagineer Rolly Crump, now full of new neon fixtures, a bright 90s color scheme, and some very interesting patterns on its carpet, the restaurant's new look was probably the most interesting thing about it, as it still continued serving the same old basic stuff it did before. Interestingly though, the overhaul did also add another floor to the restaurant right above the original. Initially, that space was actually reserved for a planned but never really built people mover attraction at Epcot that would go through the Communicore buildings. But by the time the 90s rolled around, the project was already abandoned, so the space was just reused as extra restaurant seating. The Electric Umbrella also got to keep the Stargate's old outdoor seating area, only losing the original view of a small pond in the Communicore Plaza, when the whole thing was paved over in the 90s to make more room for guest traffic through the area. Another similar restaurant could be found just across the plaza over in Communicore West, with the Sunrise Terrace. Pretty much functioning the same as Stargate, the restaurant was really just a couple of counter service windows and places to sit next to the old Communicore exhibits. And like the Stargate, it was also changed during the Intervention's refurb, this time splitting into two separate restaurants. The section of it closest to the rest of Interventions, and where you would previously order your food, was turned into the Pasta Piazza Restaurante, which sold, uh, you guessed it, Italian foods. Maybe not the most authentic Italian foods, but I guess it gets the job done. And the other part of the building, the little circular seating section like the Electric Umbrella had, ended up becoming its own standalone eatery, now named the Fountain View Espresso and Bakery, which I'm guessing was named after its view of the fountain that was right next to it. Be a pretty big coincidence otherwise. Eventually, the Pasta Piazza ended up shutting down in 2001, sitting empty for the next couple years before becoming the Epcot Character Connection in 2006, later known as the Epcot Character Spot. Meanwhile, the Fountain View began operating seasonally around the same time as Pasta Piazza's closure, later closing down completely a few years afterwards. That was until 2007, when the space reopened as an ice cream shop that was sponsored by Eddie's. And even though the shop was only meant to be a temporary experiment to see how well an ice cream shop would do at Epcot, the success it saw in that location just meant that Disney left it there as is for the next six years, even down to keeping the temporary banner that they had out front. But the space was finally transformed yet again into a Starbucks in 2013. Really? You guys are gonna get rid of some yummy ice cream in favor of just a brown caffeinated liquid? Okay, that's not delicious. It doesn't have sprinkles on it. Not cool, guys. 
This was really just part of the larger effort for Starbucks to open a location at every Disney park, as they were also rolling one out at the Magic Kingdom around the same time, and on their way to get ones opened at both Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom a couple years later. And guys, if I gotta explain why a generic coffee shop that you can find on any street corner in the country is out of place at Epcot, you know, a place that's all about experiencing new things, especially when it comes to food, then I'm sorry, it's already too late for you, okay? Just tune out now while you're still ahead, because I'm coming for Joffrey's next. Alright, no coffee will be safe on this channel. Anyways, we'll be heading back to touch on the current status of Starbucks and all those other restaurants a little later, but for now, I want to head just up the path to another location in that same Interventions West building. Originally, the space was home to Communicore's Expo Robotics display that we talked about back in Episode 2, later turning into a demonstration called the Walt Disney Imagineering Labs in 1994, which was eventually closed a year after that. Well, it wasn't long before the building was repurposed again in 1998, to now be something called Ice Station Cool, a strangely themed beverage tasting attraction that was sponsored by Coca-Cola. As soon as you walked up to the building, you'd be greeted by its odd arctic theming, with the big snowcat they had parked out front and mounds of ice that were pouring out of the building. And things managed to get even weirder once you were inside. Going in through the front took you through a little walkthrough section that was themed to look like a snowy cave, even complete with some real snow on the ground. This little part of the building was always kept uncomfortably cold to keep the snow from melting, which actually ended up making it a nice little cool down spot for hotter days at the park. The cave also had this really creepy looking frozen caveman in it too, who was apparently the Refreshus Maximus, the same caveman that the whole fictional Coke expedition was named after, which I will say was some pretty interesting theming. I mean, it doesn't make any sense why they chose it, but I don't really care. It's still cool and captures that weird 90s Epcot vibe. Once you made it through the cave, you'd be in the expedition's main research center, where you could test out some of the different flavors they found while they were out there, including soft drinks from Japan, Mexico, Israel, Germany, and of course, Italy, with their famous Beverly, a drink that was known for its surprisingly bitter taste. I also really love the theming they had in this room too. It's kind of got that test track queue type of feel to it, with tons of little details all over the place. I don't know, it's just a neat look the building has. Unfortunately though, the location was eventually changed in 2005, when they removed all of its old Arctic theming and gave it a newer, more contemporary look, also renaming it to Club Cool. But the attraction still functioned the same way as it did before, serving little samples of various Coke products from around the world, just now without any kind of unique theme to it. Regardless, the new Club Cool was still a pretty fun attraction, between tasting all the different flavors and pranking people who didn't know any better with the Beverly, you could have a pretty good time, even without the snowball fights that Ice Station Cool offered. Club Cool kept on operating without any real changes for the next 14 years, only updating a couple of the drinks they had back in 2013. But it was recently closed down altogether in September of 2019, as Disney began to make way for an extensive overhaul of the area. From some of the new Epcot concept art that they showed at the last D23, the whole plaza is set to look very different by the end of its refurb. And now that demolition has actually started on the area, you can see they weren't kidding around, as Fountain View ended up getting gutted and torn down, the same way Club Cool did, and the entire Interventions West building, that used to house the Epcot character spot, has pretty much been leveled at this point. And even though the buildings themselves aren't going to be coming back, there have been some rumors that Club Cool as an attraction isn't going away permanently, and will end up reopening somewhere else in the park after the refurb's finished. Which wouldn't be that surprising, considering the fact that something similar already happened with the Starbucks, when they opened their own little temporary location near the World Showcase. I mean, we should have expected that. It's gonna take more than some puny demolition to kill a Starbucks, alright? It's like a cockroach, gonna survive the apocalypse. The Electric Umbrella was also closed around the same time for the renovation, and may or may not be coming back once they stop construction and make the area accessible again. 
I don't think that part of the Innoventions building is getting demolished, but they might just want to use the space as something else. Once again, we'll just have to see. But before we move on completely from the old Future World counter service restaurants, we gotta make a quick stop over at the Odyssey, which is probably the park's most recognizable ex-restaurant. Back during some of the early planning stages for Epcot, the building was originally meant to be a little bit closer to the rest of Communicore, and function like the Stargate and Sunrise Terrace, just another place to get some of your standard theme park foods. But an unexpected sinkhole that popped up in that original spot meant that Disney would have to slightly relocate the building, and turn that same sinkhole into the pond that the restaurant ended up on top of. Given the Odyssey's unique location and design when it did open, it was actually one of the more interesting quick service locations in the park. And on top of the food, the space was also home to a small stage show throughout the late 80s called Mickey's Rockin' Celebration, which was actually one of the first Epcot shows to include Disney's more traditional characters, kind of their introduction into the park. And even though the final restaurant wasn't actually part of Communicore, it too was affected by the Innoventions update, when it was closed completely in 1994. All the other facilities in that building kept operating, like the bathrooms, baby care center, and first aid. But the main building itself never returned as its original restaurant. In the years since then, the space has been used sporadically for just about everything. Various private events, the festival center for stuff like food and wine, an art gallery, and all kinds of different little expos. Really, if you can imagine it, it's probably been in the Odyssey before. Most recently though, the building has been transformed into the Epcot Experience, a little preview center for all the new stuff that'll be coming to the park. Considering the fact that it's all set up now, with these new projections, models, and a huge 360 degree video, I don't think this change is as temporary as everything else they've had in there. And I can definitely see it updating as new projects get added and old ones finished. At least until Epcot wraps up their big reimagining over the next couple years. Something else that's nice is the old counter service windows are back operating, and they seem to be serving some more interesting food this time around. Eh, I guess Epcot really is changing. But that's enough of all the boring foods, okay? I don't come to Epcot for stuff I can get at a baseball game. Or, in the Epcot experience's case, uh, Panera Bread. My taste buds are far too refined for such nonsense. So, if you're looking to get some more decent food and soak up some culture while you're at it, you're going to want to check out some of the World Showcase's offerings. Hello, fellow world travelers. Welcome to the World Showcase, a great place to experience the sights and sounds of far-off countries, but more importantly, 21 great places to eat. Why don't you come join me as we sample some yummy treats on our around-the-world culinary expedition. Pretty much all the different pavilions there hosted their own unique restaurants serving up some interesting foods from their respective countries. So, as we take a little trip around the World Showcase Lagoon, I'll be pointing out some of the more noteworthy restaurants in each pavilion. The first of which is Canada's Le Cellier Steakhouse. Nowadays, the location functions as a pretty upscale steakhouse, but it actually started out as a kind of buffet cafeteria back when the park first opened, with a not-too-exciting menu later transitioning into the current steakhouse sometime in 1997, but still keeping the old Le Cellier name. Nearby, the United Kingdom Pavilion is still mainly known for its Rose and Crown pub, which is pretty much just what it sounds like, an old English-style bar. But the location also has a dining room attached to it that serves all of your stereotypical UK foods. Fish and chips, shepherd's pies, and bangers and mash. That's always a fun one to say. And on top of that, they've also got an appetizer called Scotch Eggs, which are actually hard-boiled eggs inside a sausage that are deep-fried, and surprisingly good tasting given that description. For some reason, the eggs ended up disappearing from the menu sometime around the 90s, but eventually came back just because people loved them so much. Another little one-off location in that same area is the Refreshment Port, which is over by the Canada Pavilion, more recently, the small building has become better known for its poutine, but it actually used to be home to a McDonald's that they had in the park, where you could get some of their classic fries and McNuggets. Eventually, though, 
The contract between Disney and McDonald's ended up expiring around the late 2000s, and the space would later shut down altogether in 2009, before coming back as just another quick service location, but under that same refreshment port name, which is not to be confused with the refreshment outpost on the other side of World Showcase, which is an African-themed drink stand that you can find along the promenade. Way back when, this space was originally planned to be used for an Equatorial Africa pavilion at the park that never actually came to fruition. But that's okay, because we still got the next best thing. Have you ever wanted to order an overpriced Coke while kids are banging on drums right next to you? Well, now you can finally get that authentic African experience. Most of the other real restaurants in the World Showcase seem to specialize in whatever foods that country is particularly known for like the Italy Pavilion's Via Napoli, a pizzeria that I hear is pretty good, and comes with some even better portions. The same can be said about China's Nine Dragons, which really just serves all of your favorite Chinese foods. But if you're looking for something more eccentric, you can always stop by the restaurant Marrakesh in Morocco, which has all types of Mediterranean and Middle Eastern dishes like kebabs, couscous, and a bunch of different cooked vegetables. Meanwhile, other places, like Japan, step up the experience a little with their own hibachi restaurant, called Tepan Edo. Another place that's been around since opening day, they mainly focus on teppanyaki-style table cooking and the little show that comes with it. Almost like a Benihana, except it's not actually anybody's birthday. The pavilion's also got some other places to eat, too, ranging from a little quick-service noodle restaurant to a nicer table-service spot called Tokyo Dining. And they also recently opened one of the most expensive places to eat in the whole park, with the new Takumi Te that just rolled out last year. And speaking of new restaurants, the America Pavilion also just opened a new one too back in February with their Regal Eagle Smokehouse, replacing the old location's burger and fries type menu with some higher quality barbecue foods, which is good to see that Epcot in general is getting away from all the cheaper stuff they used to serve. And finally, You've got some of the places that are better known for their scenery and theming, rather than the food itself. Like the Germany Pavilion's Beer Garten, which is in this really big room they've got themed to look like an old German town at night, and also has a little stage show going on that really adds to the atmosphere. There's also the San Angel Inn over in Mexico, which is set up somewhat similar, except it's in a quaint Mexican village. And instead of a stage, some of the tables have a really great view of this little water area that the boats for the Grand Fiesta Tour ride actually pass through, which is pretty neat to see. So, whether you're looking for a nice location, an interesting theme, or just something good to eat, the World Showcase's restaurants have pretty much always got you covered. Well, as we come to the close of our expedition, you may be asking yourselves, what about the countries of the World Showcase, such as Japan, Germany, Mexico, China, Morocco, and the American Adventure? Well, sure, they've got authentic restaurants, but frankly, I'm full. But to wrap things up, I want to take us back over to Future World to check out some of the stuff they've got at the Land Pavilion. Ever since Epcot opened, this building has pretty much been the epicenter for all things food at the park. You can eat it there, uh, go on a ride next to it, you can listen to it sing, all types of different food stuff going on, a little something for everybody. And the first thing that we're hitting is the Farmer's Market, or the building's counter service location. The market was originally made up of three different windows that each sold everything from baked goods to soups and even barbecue foods. And while it did continue to operate, the whole thing was eventually renamed the Sunshine Season Food Fair in 1993, and then later just the Sunshine Season in 2005. But it still continues to operate to this day. Of course, the pavilion was also home to its own table service restaurant as well, called The Good Turn which got that name based on the fact that the entire restaurant would slowly rotate as you were in it, allowing for a little overhead view into part of the Living with the Land boat ride, which takes place on the other side of the pavilion. And a little side note, the greenhouses that you pass through on that ride actually provide a lot of the food that they serve in the restaurant too, which is pretty interesting to hear. But 
I don't want to get too deep into that ride just yet, because there's more than enough to talk about with its own video later on. The restaurant's original name was eventually changed to the Land Grill Room in 1986, and then the Garden Grill Restaurant in 1993, when Nestle took over the pavilion sponsorship. But it still operates and rotates just like it did before. And finally, the moment you've all been waiting for, we gotta talk about the handwich. Keith, I've been dying to know, what is a handwich? It's a sub kind of roll that instead of being served in a long fashion, sandwich fashion, the bread is hollowed out so that you can stuff the meats inside and eat it actually like a cone. Mm -hmm. So you can walk, talk, and eat. And have a free as you go kind of thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a handwich. There. My God, what genius. Back when it was still around, the handwich was a real staple of not just Epcot, but Disney in general, as it also existed over at the Magic Kingdom as well. Well, well okay, wait a minute, guys. I mean, I like the handwich as much as anybody else, but I'm not so sure it qualifies as an attraction. Oh, dude, I've been meaning to ask, uh, what's your favorite attraction? Bro, it's gotta be the handwich. For some reason, they stopped getting served at the parks back in the mid-90s, but have since made a mild comeback in some slightly revised forms, with stuff like the Cone Sandwich at Cars Land over in California, and a weird croissant-looking thing that they had at Hollywood Studios a while back, which would actually make its way over to Epcot during one of the food and wine festivals. So, I guess it's one of those full-circle type situations. And while we're already talking about it, I gotta give a quick shout-out to all the different Epcot festivals, starting with the original Flower and Garden one that they began back in 1993, then the Food and Wine, which started in 1995, and finally, the newer Festival of the Arts, all of which provide some unique food items at these little booths throughout the World Showcase. Really, not too much else to say about them beyond that, unless you want to talk about all the different stuff they've had over the years, but I'm a little too tired right now to go on about food items like the frothy ramen for the next 20 minutes. You know, there's only so much even I can take. So anyways, that's really all the stuff that I wanted to cover with this episode. Of course, there's plenty more restaurants at the park that I didn't get to. So, I'm interested to hear what kind of stuff you guys like that I didn't touch on. I just try to mainly keep it about the stuff that's either gone or particularly weird. Either way, I hope you didn't get too hungry and... I'll be seeing you guys with another one of these real soon. Keith, if I come up with any ideas about new food stuff, I'll make sure I give you a call. Scott, I've seen you cook. Uh, let's leave that to the professionals. Thanks. All righty. Check, please.